You will hear a conversation between a customer and a booking officer at a theatre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4 on page 2. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, Theatre Royal Plymouth. Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to make a booking, please. Yes. What is it you want to see? The imposter. Right. The man wants to see the imposter. So, imposter has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, Theatre Royal Plymouth. Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to make a booking, please. Yes. What is it you want to see? The imposter. Right. And which day did you want to come? Friday the 25th. Just a moment and I'll check availability on the computer. Oh, sorry, we're fully booked for that performance. Oh dear. Um, what about the following day then? The 26th? Yes, that's OK. We've got two performances on that day. One at 3.30 and one at 7. Which would you prefer? Oh, the later one, please. Mm-hmm. How many people? Well, there are four of us. Are there any concessions? Any children? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, my daughters are 15 and 12. Do they get concessions? Only the 12-year-old, I'm afraid. So that's one child and three adults. Any idea where you'd like to sit? Stalls or circle? Uh... Tickets for the stalls are a bit more expensive. £12 for adults and £8.50 for children. The circle costs £10.50 and £6.50. Do you get a good view from the circle? Oh, yes. And in fact, we've got some seats left at the front, if you'd like those. Right. We'll go for those, then. Right. That's seats A21 to 24, then. They're very good seats. That sounds fine. So, let's see, that comes to £38 altogether for the tickets. How do you want to collect them? Shall I put them in the post? They'd be sent today by first-class mail, and there'd be an additional charge of £1 to cover postage and administration. Or do you want to get them from the box office yourself? Oh, yes. Could you send them, please? No problem. That'll be £39 altogether. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10 on page 2. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Could I just take your card details? What kind of card is it? Visa? Switch? MasterCard. OK. And the number? It's 3290 Double nine. OK. And the name on the card, please. It's Mr J Witten. W-H-I-T-T-O-N. N for never or M for mother? N for never. Thank you. And now I've nearly finished, but I just need your address and postcode. Yes, it's 42 South Street. OK. Is that Plymouth? 
London. And the postcode? It's SW25GE. That's fine, then. The ticket should be with you tomorrow. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yes. I was wondering if I could get regular information about what's on. Certainly. I can just add your name to our mailing list. Would that be OK? That would be very good. Yes, please. Oh, and there is something else. Sorry. One of our group is hard of hearing, and I've heard that you can supply special headphones. That's right. As long as you tell us in advance, we can always do that. I'll book those for you now, and you can just collect them from the box office before the show. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You hear a club leader giving information to a group of young people who are planning to do a two-week holiday course at the Tamerton Centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, everyone. I've been asked to talk to you this afternoon about next month's trip to Tamerton Study Center for the two-week course. Now, some of the things I'm going to say you may have already heard or read about, but I think it's important to emphasize a few key points. First of all, it's worth reminding you why Tamerton was set up in the first place, in the late 1960s. That was really before all the concern with preserving the environment, which everyone talks about these days. The idea was simply to get people out of the cities and into the country, and to find out that just being outdoors can be very rewarding. This is not going to be a holiday in the usual sense. It's called an adventure course because you'll really be stretched to your limits, but that in itself can be a positive thing. The group I took last year, for example, said that although they actually felt pretty weak and exhausted all the time, <laughs> it really made them learn a lot about themselves and increased their confidence. And in the end, that's the most important thing. Now, all of you knew about policies at Tamerton before you signed up for it, so you know that in many ways it's quite old-fashioned. You don't have a lot of choice in what you do. But something which I think makes the place so special is that you get to try so many different things every day. For instance, one day you'll do climbing, and the next you'll be surveying rock pools. It's not intended that you become an expert in any of them. It's more like a taster, which you can follow up if you want. And there isn't a lot of free time. Organized activities and talks, etc., go on until 9 p.m., and lights go out at 11 p.m. There are table tennis tables with all the equipment, 
and board games, though I have to say the pieces often go missing, so it's a good idea to take your own. There's a DVD player with a good selection of films suitable for this age group, so don't take yours. Bedtime at 11 p.m. is strictly enforced, and there's a good reason for this. You're all under 18, and we organizers need to know that all group members are accounted for in the house as we close for the night. And of course, you'll be so exhausted anyway that you'll be too sleepy to want to cause any trouble. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, what should you pack? The information sheet tells you a lot about what clothing to bring. But what about other things? Well, Tamerton House has its own small shop. But anything there is several miles away, so you won't have many opportunities for buying supplies. So in this last part of my talk, I'm going to explain what objects you should take with you to the center, what you can take if you want, and also, very importantly, what you cannot take. Several of you came up to me before this talk and asked whether you can take things like kettles or hair dryers. The answer is, there are plenty of these electrical appliances available in the center and they are of the proper voltage and are checked regularly. Yours may not be, so the rules at Tamerton say you can't bring them into the center because it's considered a fire risk. Remember, it's a very old house. Now another question was about cell phones. Although you definitely can't have them on during inside talks, you equally definitely need them when you're out on exercises. So they're a must, I'm afraid. Anybody who wishes to talk to me about borrowing a phone for the fortnight, please see me after this talk. Now, the weather's heating up at the moment, and you'll be outdoors a great deal. If you wear proper clothing, especially a hat, sun cream is optional. Also, they sell high-factor cream in the shop, so you don't have to take any of your own unless there's a special kind you use. Now, there's a special note about things like deodorants, which come in aerosol cans. I need to tell you that these are banned in the center, because apparently they have the habit of setting off the fire alarms. If you want to take an aerosol can, you'll actually be at risk of being told to leave. And finally, people have been asking about whether they need to take towels. Well, the center does provide one towel per guest, which you're required to wash yourself. If you're happy with that, then don't bring another. If not, take one of your own. Just remember how much outdoor exercise you'll be doing and how dirty and wet you'll be getting. You might that is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers, successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me, then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two-thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer and only one-third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Actually, in the end, they often have both because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hard-working people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright she is so worried that she has missed something, she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well... Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we, 
came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes. Loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job, and learned something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on managing creativity in business. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. The topic of today's management lecture is managing creativity in your business. And believe me, this is one of the toughest tasks that any manager has to face. How do you lead and control the staff whose job it is to create new business and product ideas for you? They are the ones full of creativity and imagination, so they need to have a lot of freedom. After all, they are the people who are paid to come up with new ideas. Controlling staff who are at the forefront of innovation will be one of your most challenging tasks. After all, creativity implies freedom of thought and action. Management styles used to be different. Especially in manufacturing, in the factory, staff would be told what to do and how to do it, with a watchful eye kept on them. In that setting, standardization was important for efficiency and product quality. Work could be exceptionally boring, and there was no place for individuality. Now, of course, robots have taken over many of the exacting, repetitive tasks. Nowadays, we employ far more people to generate business than to manufacture products. It's very competitive out there. Innovation—that's what our modern consumer craves. Successful companies have got the message: we need lots of new ideas, and now we employ bright young minds to come up with them. However, these ideas have to be implemented to make a change to our profits. So we have to find staff with entrepreneurial flair, and be ready to listen to them and support them to follow through on their ideas. We need to supervise without stemming the flow of ideas or sending the brightest minds to work for the opposition. Creative people won't welcome us always looking over their shoulder and checking up on what they are doing. One of the most common ways that management handles this problem of keeping people working along company lines. Is by establishing achievement targets, like money earned, products developed, or clients gained. 
These targets are a useful guideline, but they have a downside. Young, enthusiastic staff will be very keen to meet these targets, and some of them might potentially use illegal means or behave unethically in order to meet requirements. For example, by offering bribes to gain sales, or making their sales numbers or earnings look higher than they are, or even threatening or criticizing other staff to get a job completed. Achievement targets are often linked directly to performance bonuses, and this can make a bad situation worse. So as you can see, the standard management techniques can create inherent problems both for the individual and for the company. More recent theorists suggest new tactics for managers. Robert Simons, writing in the Harvard Business Review, has added some new concepts to the thorny problem of encouraging creativity while maintaining a viable business. He suggests three control levers to assist in getting positive creative contributions from the workforce. Remember, this is the point. We want creativity, wild, vibrant creativity to compete in the marketplace. Yet we must be careful to keep people on track, sticking to our core business and maintaining the company's reputation. The first of his levers is getting the workers actively involved in the central ethos of the business. One of the most common ways to do this is to create a mission statement. But along with that, many businesses have some kind of motto, which summarizes their key idea. For example, the most durable tools in the world, or perhaps the customer comes first. Whatever it is, you'll want your bright minds to believe it and act on it. So Robert Simons suggests that it should be developed with staff input, letting them feel like part of the operation. After all, their jobs depend on it. A second lever was once described by Charles Christensen, professor at Harvard Business School, as the power of negative thinking. You can't continually instruct your creative minds on what they should do. They are meant to be inventing leading, not following, and telling them what to do is counterproductive. But you can tell them what not to do, which potential products are not related to the company's objectives, or which strategies or behaviors are unacceptable. This is a tactical ploy to maintain the company's integrity. It's absolutely vital to establish boundaries to assist in controlling innovation without suppressing it. The third lever is basically sitting down with your crew to share ideas about the business. As manager, your duty is to stay abreast of the external factors such as who's competing in your market, how well is the company doing this month, and are you losing or gaining money? Is there some new product seducing your customers? This lever is called interactive control. This means you talk to your innovators and communicate honestly and clearly about your perceptions of what's happening in the market. You encourage them to share their ideas and make plans together for the future. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.